I think I should retitle my talk, Obligate Cedars Part 3, but with a little <laughs> twist. Let's we'll see if we get to the twist. Um, I'm going to actually talk about a rare manzanita species as a model for thinking about management of locally restricted species and especially obligate cedars. Dennis Odian and I started our research on Moro Manzanita in 1995, and he was my key collaborator on this research. I was also lucky to work with other great folks, including Dan Mead, Max Moritz, Chris Coffrin, and had support from Fish and Wildlife Service and California Department of Fish and Wildlife. First, some uh, setting, some context and natural history. Moro Manzanita is a, uh, an endemic species restricted to the central coast. And if we uh, zoom out, let's see if I can use this arrow. Does that show up? Yep. Here we are at Cal Poly. If we go about 20 miles to the west, we end up at Moro Bay, Los Osos, and Montano de Oro State Park. And that's where we will find uh, Moro Manzanita. Historical distribution was about 800 to about 1,100 hectares. Its uh, current extent is about 350 hectares. In large part, you can see uh, uh, in yellow is the current distribution, kind of chopped up by residential development. And here we have some contiguous stands that are relatively high cover of the species, 75 to 100 percent, but many other stands are low cover and uh, quite isolated. A little more natural history, we uh, generally see uh, Moro Manzanita in maritime chaparral with Cenothus cuneatus, Adenostoma fasciculatum, some Quercus agrifolia, but we also see it in coastal dune scrub habitats with the uh, sages and Ericomeria, uh, Baccarus. One just kind of interesting thing is that when you think about, or when I think about Manzanitas, I think about that beautiful red kind of waxy bark. This as the one distinguishing characteristic is this gray shreddy bark. And even though most of the individuals are say one to three meters, we also have um, some individuals, Chris is about two meters. Uh, this is an individual that's probably about eight meters or so. So there are a few stands where we have this, um, I guess we'd call it old growth tree-like manzanitas. Um, because of the uh, reduced distribution, this was listed as uh, uh, threatened by Fish and Wildlife Service under the Endangered Species Act in 94. We are trying to think about predicting impacts of changing fire regimes. I mean, wow, what a mouthful to try to address each of those parts. First, we have to ask about what is the impact of fire on our species. In this case, uh, and awesome uh, first talks. Uh, it's an obligate cedar. Um, the adults lack a burl, so it can't re-sprout after fire. So if an intense fire comes through, it's killed. And post-fire regeneration is dependent on soil stored seed. Next question we might want to ask for a fire-dependent species is what is it about fire that stimulates germination? We did a, a number of seed germination trials, and I'll just show results from one. We use the sort of suite of treatments that many of you, I'm sure, have used when you're looking at this sort of thing. In addition to controls, we had heat and charate, heat only, charate only. And as you might uh, um, have predicted, I'm sure, highest germination rate with heat and charate. Interestingly, reduced germination relative to the controls in just one of those. One thing I hope you're also noticing is, are you kidding me? Is this a wrong <laughs> scale? I'm excited because we got four and a half percent germination on our best treatment. And uh, that might be um, depressing, uh, but it also might not be surprising to many of you who maybe have tried to grow out these uh, kinds of species. However, I'm going to tell you that uh, this trial, we used about 2,000 seeds. Um, we also took 500 and cut them open to assess viability. So cut it in half and looked for a viable embryo. And what we found was actually that estimated uh, that viability was crazy low as well, about 4.5%. So that is a little bit depressing. However, um, when you, uh, with that information, we can see that this treatment, heat and charite, we actually got 100% of seeds that were possible uh, to germinate. To germinate. 
The other thing you'd want to know about uh, understanding impacts of fire is if you can, do a prescribed burn study and see what happens. We were lucky to uh, have the support. We didn't do the burn, but uh, California State Parks, in um, concert with Cal Fire, thanks for that, conducted a prescribed burn in Montano de Oro in a small site, about two hectares. And this was a site that actually was the youngest stand uh, at 40 years old in this, uh, in this area. We uh, assessed uh, stand age by looking at historical air photos and um, as far back in these areas, about 1940. So anyway, this site had been burned in um, 1958. Uh, big flame, um, uh, flame heights, it was quite uh, a hot burn, 15 meter flame heights. Um, but uh, here's Dennis looking over at uh, our, this um, site. There were some patches, as you might also expect in a prescribed burn that didn't burn. Uh, most of the unburned here is Quercus agrifolia. But in places that had been thick, uh, Moro manzanita, uh, that the burn was quite complete. And uh, here's Max assessing that with uh, these water cans. So it was hot. Um, and uh, of course, the temperature varied from location to location. But another question we want to ask is, OK, how about if we're dependent, it's an obligate seeder dependent on viable seed in the soil, how many are killed in the burn? We set up, uh, we took soil cores before and after the burn. And on the uh, y-axis here is shown the number of viable seeds per meter squared. And here we're looking at the upper five centimeters of soil, because that's where the majority of viable seed was. Prior to the burn, let's just say uh, a lot of variation, but about 250. After the burn, we had about 75 loss of viable seed. Um, and so, um, let's see, here we go. So high mortality of viable seed. And the next question, of course, uh, and all you obligate cedar fans want to know is, is this enough? 50, that sounds pretty good, 50 seeds per meter squared. Um, and so we looked at that. And the question is, as, um, as other speakers have suggested, that uh, is the replacement. Do the number of seedlings replace numbers of adults lost? Before the fire, uh, there were, let's just say, about one adult per meter square. So that's what we're, as John uh, mentioned, we just need one, right, but one long term. Um, but what we found is, uh, and so we actually had more than one seedling emerge. Um, but of course there's mortality and so uh, over that first year uh, we uh, lost most of those seedlings. Interestingly and unexpectedly, um, I thought, uh, the second year we had new seedlings emerge. Um, so they did not all germinate in that first year. Uh, that was quite promising but again high mortality. And so we end up with about 0.44 uh, seedlings per meter square. So. Um, a uh, couple conclusions from that. The number of seedlings that we see coming up is dependent on how, what the viable seed density is. And at three years post burn, the seedling numbers were less than half of what we saw in the number of pre-burn adults. I remind you this is a 40 year old stand, yikes. And so we were concerned that there may be, uh, and, um, this was a case of immaturity risk. Who knew that 40 years could be immature? Um, However, um, the, if you drive by that site, it's very intriguing because you can see some nice Moro Manzanita in this area. So I was able to revisit that site in March of uh, last year and ask what is the vegetation of woody species 25 years later. That's the one benefit to being old. You have time to go back. And uh, I was able to re-find about 12 of our original plots that had been in dense Manzanita. Um, and as I uh, mentioned, three years after the fire, very low cover. I'll point out that this is percent cover, not numbers of individuals. But what was uh, at least uh, fairly heartening, uh, back up to 25 years later, 83% cover in these areas. So the percent cover of Mora Manzanita is still less than it was pre-burn, but it's closer. And because I wasn't able to count numbers of individuals, there are many stems that, are, um, that go out, uh, there may still have been a loss of individuals, um, but at least cover is closer. So just summarizing impacts of fire, 
Uh, there's high seed mortality with fire, but seed germination is enhanced with direct effects of fire, the heat and chariot together. It's not, ab it's not um, absent, but seedling recruitment in the absence of fire is very rare and generally in places where, we, uh, where there's disturbance. Post-fire regeneration success depends on the density of viable seed in the soil seed bank, so look out if you have low viability. 40-year stand recover may be adequate. Uh, again, may have still uh, resulted in a loss of individuals. But if you can, uh, live long and prosper, and uh, the post-fire regeneration is perhaps best assessed longer term. So how about the part of this uh, predicting changing fire regimes? I'm going to just take one of those aspects of fire regimes frequency. Can we ask, in these, uh, for in these sites, are they, are we, do we think they're going to be more or less frequent? And I think there are a number of things that contri may contribute to a change in fire frequency. One is that, as I uh, pointed out before, the remaining stands are highly fragmented and right in there next to uh, urban development. We know that since the early 1900s, there have been fire suppression. And in the, all the records that I can see, there have only been two burns, at least since the 19, uh, early 1940s. And those were both prescribed burn, including the one that um, I worked in. Um, and uh, another factor that can affect fire frequency, frequency is the presence of flammable invasives. And we got them. Uh, there's a lot of veldt grass in the dune area. And uh, both here and here, you can see a lot of eucalyptus. There are dense uh, eucalyptus plantations in Montana de Oro. So how, what do we think, uh, more or less? These are some of the uh, things that I think may contribute to change in fire frequency over time. One is fragmentation. It's true that in uh, the, um, the uh, urban interface, ignitions may be higher. But I think especially at this uh, site, probably reduced fire frequency due to fragmentation because of intense uh, fire suppression. The presence of flammable non-natives could increase fire frequency. Climate change, hard to know, as we heard from Mike. These uh, systems are influenced by maritime, uh, these maritime chaparral systems are influenced by fog. And I think there's a debate about how that might, may change. But I, I will just say, maybe clim in, uh, climate change will have to see increase in fire frequency. In these systems, I think the uh, most likely scenario is that we'll actually get fewer fires because of the, um, the setting, the landscape where these are, and the likelihood that there'll be even further um, fragmentation, sadly to say. Um, and so I think we can need to ask, if fires become less frequent, um, is there a potential senescence risk in these old growth stands? Um, this was the picture I showed you with uh, Chris. And here, um, as well as in the Elfin Forest Preserve, uh, we do see old uh, skeletons, and, um, which may not be a problem. They're, um, they're quite beautiful. So how do we know? One way we might look at this is to ask, what is the seed bank? And how does that change over time? And so we uh, sampled uh, seed banks in three different sites at three different ages, we think. The dune site was the one that, where we had the controlled burn. Uh, the large sands in Hazard Canyon, probably intermediate age. And the elfin forest, where these large uh, sort of giants are, are uh, probably older. And on the y-axis shown number of intact seeds, and here number of viable seeds. And I'll point out that um, with concern that the viable seed density in these uh, sites is really low. I showed you that average uh, seed viability is about 4.5%. At this site, it's closer to 2%. And so uh, I would suggest that the oldest stands, uh, well, the oldest stands do have probably very low viable seed densities. And so even more infrequent fire may pose a senescence risk to these uh, sites. What you see filling in underneath the large dead manzanitas are uh, mostly weedy species and things like conicosia. So um, just in conclusion, um, I know this is, uh, <laughs> this is quite ambitious. But if we can gather any of this information or all of this information about a species that's of interest to us, 
And in particular, for obligate seeders, I think that we'll be better equipped to guide management and uh, hopefully help sustain these species into an uncertain future. Thank you very much. <laughs>